How about bringing something that's long dead back to life? That's the subject for our next speaker. Hendrik Poiner, who happens to teach at McMaster University, just down the road. Um, so, like Michael, um, when I get, as an evolutionary geneticist, if I get an email from Moses, you, as an open-minded evolutionary geneticist, one pays attention uh, as to invite to come, come and speak today. Um, and I grew up actually looking through my father's microscope at insects entombed in amber. So these are uh, anywhere from 30 to 160 million years old Cretaceous amber. Some of these actually, this being the inspiration for Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park book, which my dad wished he'd written and retired from Berkeley early with a lot more money than he did. Um, and this gave me the idea that, oh, it wouldn't be fantastic to actually see, envision these creatures actually uh, come out of the resin, crawl out of the sap and, and come to life. But I always grew up um, in Berkeley uh, under the premise that extinction was basically forever, that when a species went extinct, there was no possibility at a form of resurrection. You couldn't bring something back uh, from the dead. So my idea of seeing saber-toothed tigers, uh, or the giant short-faced bear, or the, the large uh, sloth, or even the giant beaver that roamed across the estuaries of Canada all went extinct about 10,000 years ago, and the best I could do was see skeletal remains or reconstructions in museums. Uh, but extinction actually has occurred in more recent times, so here's a quagga that died in the museum, uh, the zoo actually, uh, in Amsterdam in, in 1930s. Um, and we also have, of course, the infamous dodo that went extinct because of Dutch soldiers uh, arriving on Mauritius uh, a few hundred years ago. And of course, we have uh, one of my favorite beings uh, that once existed, the stellar sea cow. So the Arctic version of the dugong, which was basically the size of a very large car and was hunted to extinction by Russian uh, soldiers uh, not that long ago. And here we actually have footage of one of the extinct animals that actually, the last one, uh, this is the Tasmanian wolf in uh, the Hobart Zoo in 1936. Uh, this was the last species, uh, and unfortunately, because no one was caring for it, it actually went extinct, the last species in the zoo, because someone had actually had forgotten to feed it over the course of the day. So beautiful animal, beautiful creatures uh, lived across and of course were driven to extinction, mostly because they, they were assumed that they were killing all the chickens in the area. And when they killed them all off, all the chickens still continued to disappear and it turned out it was escaped convicts that were just eating the chicken because they wanted to stay alive. So I've always been fascinated with the possibility of time travel. Can we go back into time? And can we just use the genetic material isolated from bones to sort of study the evolutionary history of these species? Um, and that's a possibility, especially with something that I'm particularly uh, enthusiastic about, which is the woolly mammoth. So is extinction really, now that we've looked at the DNA of these large creatures, is extinction really irreversible? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing and whether or not there's a feasibility of turning back the clock. But to do that, I have to tell you a bit about its evolutionary history. So elephants come from Africa about 7, 000, 7 million years ago, and they, like us, share a deep bond. They educate their next of kin, they bury their dead. There's some sorts of spirituality within elephants that we have as humans. And about seven million years ago, they, like us, left Africa and moved out across the globe. And the first was a two-ton, four-meter standing tall, huge elephant that actually ranged from Asia into Western Europe and all the way across the Bering Land Bridge into North America. Shortly thereafter, we had two other species arrive, a large hairless that existed all throughout Canada and the continental United States down to Mexico, and another species in Asia called the Trungotherid. But most of you know and love probably this guy, the woolly mammoth, which really only appears on the scene about 500,000 years ago. 
and it moves back and forth across this land bridge between Siberia and Alaska. As the climate gets better, as the climate gets worse, it's a highly plastic animal that does very, very well in these conditions. And it comes into contact with this large hairless beast, the Colombian mammoth living in parts of uh, continental United States. It actually even makes it out onto small islands off the coast of Alaska and Siberia. And as it typically happens with animals, they shrink in size. And so you get this island dwarfism like this mammoth shown here. And there they lived to about 3,000 years ago. So when the Egyptians were building pyramids, there were still mammoths on these small islands off the coast of Alaska. And then they disappear. And there's lots of reasons as to why we think that might have been. It could have been because of forests that were migrating from the north because of climate change. Or it could be, as postulated by Paul Martin, that actually large game hunters arriving from Siberia were actually hunting large, uh, these large animals to extinction. So it was probably a combination of a climate and human-induced impact. So we can actually study these guys by traveling up to Siberia. So you convince your wife to forego the beach vacation and get on a Russian military helicopter and head to Siberia instead. Uh, and it doesn't take much of an imagination to look out through these windows and imagine her large herds of mammoths actually walking across these uh, tundra 10,000 years ago, right? Uh, and there you actually find deep uh, cliffs where the permafrost is laid bare, uh, and you can repel uh, off the sides of these and, and pull out large uh, fossil remains. And the remains are actually spectacular, and then you put them into a, uh, back into the helicopter and you fly back to an ice cave. So this is an ice cave that was dug out by a mole drill in the 50s to actually harbor uh, nuclear weapons in Russia that they were going to use on the United States. So the back of the cave is actually quite radioactively hot. Uh, but if you stay to the front, you're usually uh, fairly safe. Uh, and there you spend uh, months uh, collecting and sampling from these hundreds of remains. And, and the preservation is actually spectacular. So here you have a mammoth foot. In the top picture on the right, you have a rib that was once sectioned. Blood actually came out. So if you've heard about the recent blood uh, stories in, in the news, uh, you find intact hair, and in fact, you can actually pull out entire carcasses and heads with brain and eye and everything. So the preservation is spectacular, even if it's a several hundred thousand years old. So I spent a lot of my time trying to understand how the DNA preserves or degrades over time. And I have to admit that even though we've been studying it for 20 years, we know relatively little about DNA preservation. But it has a lot to do of where an organism dies, whether it's in the northern latitudes or the southern latitudes, what time of year it dies, how quickly it's buried underground, the annual temperature of that burial, uh, and then, of course, the bacterial constituent, not only of the environment, but the bacterial constituent of the organism itself that dies. So it turns out that most of us are more bacteria than humans, and all your digestion is actually from the inside out when you're actually buried. So if we actually go deep within the bones and the teeth, the bacteria are now actually actively degrading your own bacteria, your own DNA for their own use in survival now that you're dead, okay? And so what they do is they cleave the DNA into little itty bitty tiny fragments. And so this makes reconstruction very problematic, okay? So we take these bones, we bring them back to a state-of-the-art clean room facility, and then we isolate the DNA using sort of standard molecular techniques. So it wouldn't surprise you that a mammoth bone will have mammoth DNA in it, but maybe it might surprise you or might not that the bulk of that DNA we get out is actually a mixture of bacteria and any kind of environmental contaminants that have fled into the bone over the course of its 60,000 years underground. Okay, so then what we have to do is we have to access all those little tiny fragments and can we actually reconstruct that into something meaningful? And in 2004, these are the machines that actually sequenced the first human genome for a billion dollars in 20 years. Right? In 2005, we were the first to show that you can actually sequence extinct genomes using this machine, which is now a doorstop in my office. That sequenced about 10 to the 5 fragments in about 24 hours. And in 2012, we're with machines that now sequence per run uh, about 10 to the 11 molecules. So everybody's genome within this room, maybe within a couple weeks, for a few thousand dollars. Right? And that's, of course, the whole promise of genomic medicine. So, we can actually take all that information, throw it through these sequencers, and then use bioinformatics to actually remove all that background that we're not interested in. And then we take all those DNA fragments and we place them up against the Asian elephant chromosome. We say, where do these differ from the Asian elephants? 
And so we can actually plot those on the Asian elephant chromosomes. Turns out that the elephants have many more chromosomes than we do. Okay, and then we can actually say, so what do we know then about the genome of a woolly mammoth? Well, human genomes are only about three billion only, bases long. So these are the A, G, C, T, the four letters that make up DNA. The mammoth genome actually turns out to be mammoth. It's about two billion more than the human genome. So it's huge genome, right? And so that allows us to do one relatively fundamental and easy, uh, address one fundamental question, which is how do the three relate? The African and the Asian elephant are the two living species today. So where does that mammoth sit if we go back seven million years? Well, it turns out that the mammoth actually probably is closer related to the Asian elephant and shares an ancestor about six million years ago, okay? So that means all those other extinct forms that I showed you early on in the evolutionary history of the mammoth lie somewhere on that lineage that led to the woolly mammoth itself. Now, I want to just tell you about two because it's important when considering this whole idea of resurrection. The woolly and the Colombian came into contact with each other at what we call periglacial ecotones. So where the northern species being pushed south because of glaciers came into contact with these large hairless Colombians in the south. And it turns out that they didn't fight for resources or anything like that, but the DNA shows that they actually interbred, okay? And it turns out that this is something we see in elephants today. Large male savanna elephants outcompete the smaller forest elephants in Africa for females. So it's like your nightmares in high school revisited all over. The large hairless males outcompete the smaller, hairier and males for the available females, right? <laughs> Now, why is this of interest? Because hybrids are a huge part of the natural reality in vertebrate and evolutionary biology. There is no pure race, so to speak. In fact, that's one of the fundamental, most important things about genetics, is it dispels the whole idea or notion of race, okay? So, actually, you can take an African and Asian elephant and produce a young, and it was done at a zoo in the UK in the 1970s. So in the Chester Zoo, here's a baby African-Asian elephant, similar to a liger, for example. So this is just to emphasize the point that there is no crystals in vertebrate species. So you may not know it, but when you go to Yellowstone and you look at the beautiful wolves that have been reintroduced, most of these are hybrids because they backbred with domesticated dogs at one point in the past. These are not pure wolves. There are no such thing as pure wolves. And in fact, the idea of raising or resurrecting species on the brink of extinction was actually introduced by the American Bison Society in the 1900s when we almost drove them to extinction. Those are all bison skulls killed off in the end of the 19th century. And so the American Bison Society said, well, let's take bison Let's put them into cattle breeds, raise them to full bison, and then take them back onto the plains of North America, which is exactly what they did in 1903. So this is the actual cattle car of bison being reintroduced to the, to the plains of, of Dakota uh, back in 1903. So we've reintroduced species from hybrid organisms. So could we do that with a woolly mammoth? Is it possible or is this just a pipe dream? Could we take each of those individual positions? Well, we can using a modern technology that George Church at Harvard has introduced. We actually reconvene the Asian elephant chromosomes to be mammoth-like. And then you can actually differentiate those chromosomes, put them into a cell, create a sperm and an egg, fertilize that, place that nucleus into another Asian elephant egg, and place that into an Asian elephant. And in theory, and of course I'm trivializing this because there's several technological steps that we still need to go, but over sort of a long period of gestation, because elephants have a two-year gestation period, you would get something that looked and felt very much like a woolly mammoth. So the first issue that people raise when I talk about this is, well, all the ecosystems that have once held mammoths are gone, and that's not at all true. They actually exist in the north, in the Northwest Territories, in the Yukon, in parts of Siberia. These territories are there today. And in fact, they're in far worse shape than they used to be because the mega herbivores that used to keep them in shape are all gone. Because the mammoth actually was a keystone species, which is one that is proportionally more important than the other species. And all the other species of plants and animals revive sort of around the aspect of these keystone species. So they're, they're, they're essential. 
So if we brought them back, the other thing that it would do is it would actually suppress the escape of greenhouse gases because most of these are turning from grasslands into moss lands, which don't hold the, ga the gases down low. So reintroduction would be relatively, quote unquote, straightforward. Now, there's lots of ethical discussions to have about uh, this. This is not, you know, the reason we bring up this research is that the hope that people can have sort of deep discussions about the implications of what this means, their deep ramifications. Are we going to create uh, apathy for current existing species that are endangered? Or could we use this technology to add diversity back into species that are on the brink of extinction today so that they don't go extinct? So there's not a single part of me, the boy in me, that would love to see this again, right? I mean, I would love to go up north and see this Pleistocene picture actually existing today. But I do have to admit that we have to think very carefully about what that means, what the ramifications mean, and have deep discussions about that now before we do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>